from Music for All and presented by Yamaha. It's Mind the Gap, a practical web series for young and future music educators. Tonight's program, Teaching Beginning Band, Choir, and Orchestra in a Virtual World, hosted by Susan Smith and David Starnes. Please welcome Susan Smith and David Starnes. My name is Susan Smith, and I'm an educational consultant for Music for All and a lecturer in music education at Troy University in Troy, Alabama. I've taught at all levels and areas of music education, and I'm especially interested in supporting young teachers as my daughters are starting their second and fourth years as music educators. I'd like to introduce my friend and colleague, David Starnes, to tell you about himself and about our webinar episode tonight. Thank you, Susan. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's episode. Um, you know, as a music ed music educator for 32 years and um, a music uh, education consultant for Music for All for the last 20 something years, um, we're at a place right now that I don't think a lot of us thought would ever be. And um, currently I am uh, the director of orchestras at Kennesaw Mountain High School and living every single day uh, what it is that we as educators are trying to make work uh, in a virtual world. Um, I come from a long lineage of music educators. My father was a lifelong music educator, and um, I feel very fortunate to have taught at all levels, elementary, middle, high school, collegiate level, in band, orchestra, and now uh, chorus, uh, doing some of that as well as far as some some help with uh, our, our program uh, at, the, at the high school level. So this is very pertinent tonight. And we developed this program tonight with the understanding that there is so much need for how you get students started um, at the beginning level when you can't be with them. And we know this is something that a lot of you have been asking for and we have phenomenal panelists for you tonight. I'd like to introduce my friend and colleague from Music for All, Mr. James Stevens, who's going to provide welcome for you and talk a little bit about uh, Music for All. James? Hey, thanks, David. Hello, uh, everybody. Good evening. Uh, just real quick, wanted to welcome you all and uh, just say on behalf of Music for All, our mission is to create, provide, and expand positively life-changing experiences through Music for All. Uh, we hope to be a catalyst to ensure that every child across America has access and opportunity to engage in active music making in his or her scholastic environment. Uh, I certainly want to thank our national presenting sponsor, uh, our, the wonderful people at the Yamaha Corporation. Yamaha supports music educators, and that is evidenced through their 25 years of commitment uh, to Music for All's programming. Uh, if you have not checked out the Yamaha Educator Suite, uh, I encourage you to do so. Uh, tonight, as uh, David and Susan mentioned, this is ep episode 13 of Mind the Gap. Uh, we have a semester uh, that is going to go all the way through May, and you can check out uh, upcoming episodes um, on our website. Uh, that's where you can uh, register uh, for future episodes and also watch past episodes. Uh, and it's my pleasure here this evening to, to share with you that just recently, uh, Mind the Gap has also uh, spun off into uh, audio podcasts. So you can find uh, the previous episodes starting to uh, release uh, on your favorite podcatcher uh, coming uh, to your uh, smart device and tablet near you. Uh, so check that out. So uh, thank you, David and uh, Susan. I'll turn it back over to you guys. Thank you, James. Um, well, I think our next um, I idea here is that we split off into three separate groups. Susan's going to be with the band folks. Um, I will be with the orchestra folks. Um, and James uh, will be moving uh, out with the choral folks. And um, at this point, um, Haley, are we good to go with that? Yeah, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and open all of the breakout rooms. And then it might take me a second to make sure that all of our guests here tonight are in the appropriate rooms. So if you could all bear with us for just a second and then um, it should pop up that you've been invited to a breakout room if you had, and you can go ahead over there and meet your panelists. All right. Very good. Well, we'll go ahead and start. And uh, as we add people, we'll continue to go. And, and again, this is being uh, taped. Um, and so you can go back, it'll be archived and released uh, in the next couple of weeks. So uh, if you have, uh, if you get in here later, you miss some of this, you want to go back and listen to it again, certainly willing to, to have that and available habit. Well, thank you to all of you who are joining us tonight via live, um, or if you're watching this um, from a, a recorded uh, uh, version. 
we are super, super stoked to offer Teaching Beginning Orchestra in a Virtual World. And we have three phenomenal uh, clinicians with us tonight that will serve as panelists. And uh, we kind of covered the United States with this one this time, rather than it being centralized in a certain area, we wanted to get um, some perspective on what's happening in the West and the Southwest or Midwest and the, and the Southeast. So we have a little bit of coverage on that. So um, without further ado, um, I would like to uh, introduce first um, Amanda Funderburk. And Amanda, if you would tell us a little bit about yourself, where you teach, and the levels that you teach, uh, and we'll meet everyone here in a moment. Mandy. Sure. Hi, um, my name is Mandy Funderburg, um, and I teach at Bellevue Middle School in Nashville, Tennessee. This is my eighth year teaching. Um, for a while, I also taught a high school class in addition to the middle school, um, and we, we have been virtual since March 12th. Wow. And we are fifth through eighth grade for our uh, grade levels. Very good. Well, we thank you for joining us. I'm sure that's going to, we're going to have some, some great, interesting conversation as far as what you've experienced the last year or so. Uh, next, we have with us uh, Bethany Hardwick. Bethany, you want to talk to us a little about your background and where you teach? Hi, everyone. I am Bethany Hardwick. I teach at Downing Middle School in Flower Mound, Texas. It's sixth through eighth grade. Um, this is my 11th year teaching. We were virtual back in March, but we have been in person since about mid-September. So it's definitely been an experience and I'm excited to talk about it tonight. Fantastic. Well, thank you for joining us. And uh, finally, um, someone who I know of her work through a, a colleague of mine, uh, and she will know the name Bill Bitter, a um, friend of mine uh, that teaches uh, in the Arizona, Gilbert, Arizona area. Please welcome Jennifer Nichols. Jennifer, thank you for being with us. Thank you. Um, I'm Jenny Nichols. I teach in Gilbert, Arizona at three elementary schools. Uh, Gilbert Elementary, Oak Tree Elementary, and Ashland Ranch Elementary. This is my 37th year of teaching, the old lady of the group. <laughs> and um, and uh, I'm just thrilled to be here. Thanks. Oh, um, and wh where have we been? Uh, we were virtual um, from March till May. We came back virtual at the beginning of the year. And we've been hybrid, in-person, hybrid, in-person. We just went back in-person on Monday. Wow, bless your heart. Well, uh, and again, I'll introduce myself. I'm David Starnes. Um, this is my 32nd year of teaching. Um, I come from a uh, wind background. I was a, a high school band director, a middle school band director, an elementary school band director, uh, a collegiate uh, athletic band director, uh, and did some orchestra along the way and uh, have just uh, left a job at Western Carolina University where I was for the last 10 years uh, to come back to Atlanta where I call that's home and uh, teach at Kennesaw Mountain High School, where I'm the, the uh, director of orchestras at Kennesaw Mountain High School. So um, very, very excited to be with you tonight. And um, this is just a, an incredible time that we're going through right now. So those of us um, that are dealing with this, I'm glad you're here. Um, and we hope we can provide some, some, um, some very uh, important information. Uh, one of the first things I wanted to throw out to the panel is, um, if we if we rewind to last March, where it seemed like the whole world shut down, and it was interesting because we we're at the Music for All National Festival in Indianapolis when this whole thing happened. We had to send 3,500 kids back off across the United States after being in Indy for just over 24 hours, um, and then we had no idea that you know a year later we're still talking about this. I don't think any of us did. Um, but so, how did the school closure in March? Um, affect things such as your performances, your um, evaluations you may have had, your, your curriculum, how you just stopped in mid-curriculum, um, and, and the recruitment even coming to this year. And I've, I've coined the phrase so many times that I think all grade levels this year are really minus one and a half right now, that we don't really have sixth graders. We have fifth and a half graders, and we don't really have high school seniors. We have 11 and a half graders because they never really finished that year and we're playing catch up. So maybe you guys can uh, give us a little bit of a, um, a perspective about how you dealt with that and what you were able to do and, and, and not able to do. Jenny, I'll, I'll start with you. We'll go west to east on this one. <laughs> we shut down uh, right after spring break and um, 
I really felt like it, they kind of shot us in the foot because they did not make anything mandatory. So everything became optional. So um, the first week I had really pretty good uh, participation with my students. I uh, recorded some lessons for them to watch. The other thing was we couldn't require them to be present at a certain time. That had to be optional. And um, so with it being optional, you know, I would say the last entire month, not one of my activities were ever even looked at by the students. So it was, um, I think it was very disheartening and I hope that we have not trained parents that education is optional. Um, that's my biggest fear is that I see more of that and more of that as we go along. And I think we started it um, last March when we didn't wanna disappoint the children or make life hard for them. And, and I think we, we're going to be dealing with the ramifications of that for many years. I couldn't agree more. Just having that conversation with a colleague today. Mandy, how did it work out in Nashville? We had a similar situation. Um, we started spring break early. Um, it was like a canceled school, maybe like three or two or three days before spring break. So they kind of were hoping, I think, that like we'd get through spring break and then we'd figure it out. Um, but very similar situation to Jenny, where once we returned um, to virtual learning, really nothing was mandatory. There were no grades. You didn't have to show up. There was no accountability. Um, so, you know, similarly, I tried to make fun things for them to do, mini projects, you know, trying to learn a solo, gave them resources you know, walk them through things, but very, very low participation in that. Um, and we, it was right before our concert festival. So mm -hmm. we didn't get to go to con concert festival uh, with my older kids. And then we were also, we had a trip to St. Louis planned um, for overnight and, you know, competition and everything. Had to refund that. That was a quite the experience refunding all those trips. Um, and then I think the thing that disappointed me most was my, my fifth graders, fifth and a half graders <laughs> now, um, <laughs> they, they didn't get to do their final concert. They didn't, they usually get to go to Dollywood, you know, perform, do the whole thing. We've been talking it up all year and they, we just had to cancel everything. And it was really, really sad that especially in those formative times where they're just getting a hold of their instrument and just getting excited, there's no payoff for them. Right. So, yeah. Wow. And Bethany, in the great state of Texas, how did that go down? I mean, a lot of what we experienced is the same. We had just finished our UIL contest, which in Texas, UIL is like the big thing that we do. Um, and so the spring is really all of our fun stuff. We were playing the theme from the Avengers and all kinds of really cool stuff. And so the kids were bummed that we were missing out on our costume concert and our, all of our fun things. So I, when it became very clear that we were not going back this semester, we started focusing more on their, you know, their social emotional learning and what was going on with them because we really were going through something kind of epic. So I did these silly practice challenges where they had to like play like Lindsey Sterling or, you know, play with their instrument backwards, just things to keep them engaged, even though they weren't really progressing on their instrument with those challenges, just something fun to do. Um, I, and then my choir director and my theater director, we all joined TikTok and started making silly teacher TikToks and posting them and the kids loved them. Mm -hmm. So we kind of turned it from, oh my gosh, they're getting behind on their instruments and turned it into these kids are going through a crisis. What can we do to support them and make them laugh and feel this orchestra community? Because to me, that was the big thing that we lost was being together every day. So this was kind of a way to bring us together, socialize, do things like that instead. That's fantastic. And I think we've heard the social emotional learning, you know, label has really saved a lot. I, I know I've sat down with a lot of my kids and just said, are you guys okay? You know, we've just not gotten instruments out and just talked for some time. And it's, uh, I, th I think it's healthy. I think we have to do that right now. So going to um, curriculum design, as far as, you know, if we're in the now, like where we are when you started um, this fall, um, are you guys using instruments? I mean, are, did you, those of you who teach beginning orchestra, how did you do it? I mean, I, 
I'm thankful that I'm not in your shoes right now because it's bad enough with high school kids getting to remember what they did yesterday. You know, when a middle school kid or an elementary kid has not ever done this before as a sixth grader, I, I can't imagine it. So does somebody want to take the lead on that and talk a little bit about, you know, whether you're using instruments and, and if you did instruments, how did you do it? And if you didn't, what did you replace it with? I'll be happy to jump in. Um, in my situation, for my sixth through eighth graders, um, it's pretty much business as usual as as usual as it can be in a virtual setting. Um, I'm continuing them in the method book. We're playing games. We're playing. You know, I'm I'm playing, and hopefully they're playing along with me. We're doing assessments and everything. But for beginners. We decided as a school, um, there is a band teacher and a rock band teacher, and we all decided that starting beginners right now is not a great idea starting in August um, when we started. So we kind of did a 180 and did a sort of exploratory music course for all of the fifth grade students um, starting it half of the basically one quarter was half of the grade level. The second quarter was the other half. And so we each got to teach about our, you know, subject areas. We got to get them excited about band strings or rock band and hopefully recruit in that sense. And we've never done that as a school before. And I think it actually was kind of beneficial because we got to see some of those kids that as fifth graders, they didn't know if they wanted to do music or not. And at my school, they have to choose. You either do music or you do everything else, art, Spanish, PE, rotation. So I think it was really beneficial in that sense. And I think we're going to continue doing that. But January came and we did our official recruiting. So now I do have a class of fifth grade string players. Um, no instruments yet, uh, but we just got the announcement uh, literally uh, yesterday that they are going to send us back to a, um, it's not, students could choose virtual or in person. But for the music classes, that doesn't really work. So we're going to do a hybrid model. Um, so as soon as I get them back in the classroom, I believe it is, it's about two weeks from now, um, then we're going to start with instruments. In the meantime, I've been teaching them parts of the instrument. I started them with finger workouts today, you know, isolating their different fingers. Um, I'm teaching them about the staff, line spaces, skips and steps. So basic music theory stuff. So no instruments for me for beginners. I only had one beginner in sixth grade and she's just like a rock star student. So she did everything I told her to. <laughs> so I, I am kind of lucky in that sense, but I know a lot of teachers have started beginners right from the get go and I'm really excited to hear from them. Great, so Bethany, tell us about what happened in your, your program, how you dealt with this. So we started with instruments pretty much right away. My district decided that the first three weeks of the school year were remote. So I used that three weeks to push how to take care of the instrument. And we talked about the staff and things like that before they even got their instruments. Then when we went in person, I still had a small chunk of kids that stayed virtual. And so we do a model called co-seating where essentially I've got a camera pointing at me and the virtual kids are watching me teach while I'm also teaching the in-person. So I've got two going at one time. So the virtual kids need to stay with us as far as instruments. Um, so when everybody came to pick up their instruments, the virtual kids all got like a 10 minute social distance lesson from me on how to unpack the instrument, how to hold it. And then I got together with four or five teachers in my district and we made 80 million tutorials on how to pull out an end pin, how to put on a shoulder rest and shared them with each other just so the kids had access to all of that if they forgot. Um, right now I have 15 or so virtual students and then my other 50 are in person. So most of us are in person, but out of the 15 virtual, I only have like maybe three that I'm kind of concerned about. The rest are pretty much staying with us, which is really great. So it's definitely been different. And I do a lot of the like forgetting that there's in-person kids because I'm so focused on the computer or the other way around. And so it's kind of a new mindset, but I mean, they're playing. We did a couple virtual concerts already and they've got to be included in that. And so we're making it work. That's fantastic. That's love the idea, especially the video idea. That That's something you can catalog and archive for years to come too. So. That's a good source material. Jenny, what did you do uh, from the beginning? Because it sounded like you guys were virtual, then face-to-face, -face, then virtual, then hybrid, and it's been back and forth. 
Yeah, we we really have been. We started right away with instruments. Um, you know, I don't ever start right away. I always spend two weeks getting the kids up and running. And uh, during that time, kids turn in applications for school instruments. So a lot of that happened um, uh, as, as pretty much as normal. And then we started with instruments. And um, I did really the same thing Bethany did. We made videos, we, uh, you know, and you had to sit down and think about what is the, what is the lowest thing that they have to know. And, you know, we broke it down to, you need a chair to sit on. That's not a spinny chair <laughs> that doesn't have arms. Um, and, you know, this is an appropriate chair. This is not an appropriate chair. So we, uh, we made all those videos and we put them up. And one of the benefits of those videos is that we have a lot of kids going back and forth. So uh, we have a global, what we call our global community. And those are the students who are virtual right now, 100% virtual. And they made that choice. But at any time, they can come back and be in person. And so we've had kids all year long. You get about one every week at every school. So you know, I've never had to catch up this many children at any one time. And so that has been really good to have those videos already done. And you can, I can say, go to my website and just start at the beginning and watch every video and follow along and do what it says. And I'm really finding that the kids are doing well. And I know when they've watched it because they'll come in and now you turn the end pin screw and you put, you know, and, and they're mimicking my voice and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I hope I didn't make any mistakes, you know. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, you know, along with that, you know, I'm hearing some of you say that you made videos. Um, did anybody use any instructional technology that was online based? Um, whether it be, you know, a, a, like a, a flip grid or anything like that, that, that maybe you use to help get through that bridge of when I see you for the first time or things that you used in terms of your instructional technologies. Anybody want to share any, any programs or websites that you may have used? Yeah, Jenny. I've done a lot with Screencastify. Um, it's a, I think it's an extension on, um, I, I really don't know. I'm not a tech person, but I like it because it's easy to use and it automatically saves. And that's kind of crucial because you can get kind of lost in the files. I don't know if anybody else feels that way, but my Google Drive is, uh, I don't even yeah. want to think about it. Um, and uh, so we've done a lot with Screencastify. I use Seesaw um, for my students, and that is not a district uh necessarily approved system, but I really like Seesaw because it's, um, I've always said you don't have to teach tech in order to get them to use it. So that's what I've used for my kind of flipped lessons where I have them going through and watching videos and then responding with a performance um, on the last slide. And so that's, and, and pretty much that's what I've used. The school district did buy us smart music and they did buy us finale. And we have uh, oh boy, those have been really crucial in being successful, especially the smart music because the kids can play along. That's fantastic. Mandy, anything you want to share with that? Yeah, um, we are using Schoology for our learning management system. So that's kind of how I'm organizing all of my content, you know, wherever I may be pulling it from and giving them instructions. We also uh, got a music, um, music first uh, subscription this year, which is sort of like um, smart music. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've been using that, um, and I can speak a little bit more on the ass assessment side. Um, something that I found really helpful, r probably just like this January, like early on, was um, Nearpod. Um, we started experimenting with Nearpods, and if you're not familiar, it's sort of like a it's an interactive PowerPoint where they sign into it kind of like they would a Kahoot. Um, you, you give them a code and then you as the teacher advance the slides and then some of those slides are interactive. So you can put videos in there. You can have them all watch the video at the same time. You can insert questions into the video like little activities like polls. Uh, there are drawing uh, features where you can, for example, put a staff 
all, for them all to draw on and you tell them what to write. And so you can see what all the students are doing. Um, that has been that has been game changing for the virtual setting. I really enjoy it. And I think I'm probably going to use it in a some sense for the live in person setting as well. Fantastic. And Bethany, anything you want to share with us as far as the technology side? Our district uses Canvas as our learning management system. And I know a lot of um, colleges use that as well. It was new to us about three years ago and turned out to be pretty life saving last year. I was really happy to have it. I love for the assessments that I can watch a video of the kids playing and then I can record myself talking over that video mm -hmm. so I can just kind of like catch things and talk to them about it and they can go back and listen. So as far as the assessment goes, that's been fantastic, but it's also a great way to organize. And what I love about Canvas is that if I create a course or an assignment or something, I can share it with the whole district. And I have friends in other districts and we've been able to share, one of my friends made a really great music theory course for beginners. And so he was able to share that with all of us and get that out. So Canvas is really great for creating kind of things for your online learners that have built in quizzes and things like that. But it works for in-person kids too, because I just go through it on our big screen and then they take the quiz on their own or they do the assignment or whatever it is. That's fantastic. And I'll, I'll share two or three that, that I found to be lifesavers this fall. One of them, uh, if you've ever used musictheory.net, that's a free web-based program. Um, you can even do some assessments on there. Uh, and it starts with super, super easy and then gets ridiculous hard, but it goes through every kind of music theory from notation to uh, dynamics, to counting, to uh, rhythms. It, it's fantastic. Key signatures, um, fantastic. And then the other one is um, the rhythmtrainer.com. Um, that's another really fun one that kids used. Um, and again, it's so simple because uh, it's all web-based and they can even do assessments on there and then they can send you the results. Um, so we were virtual from August all the way to the first week in November. And uh, it was, you know, sink and survive or, or make something work. And so that was really, really helpful. And I mentioned Flipgrid. I'm sure several of you flip, used Flipgrid before. Uh, we use that more for listening exercises for kids to post music and talk about what they found. Um, so I think that's another another thing. But yeah, it's it it was uh, survival time there for a while, and and how you can do it and make it still seem you know legit that you're doing something for the kids. And like Jenny, our school district gave us smart music, and boy, the kids ate that up. I mean, it was that was a lifesaver because uh, you could, we actually practiced concert music on smart music that we knew we were going to do in December when we came back and they came back and they knew it. So um, that was, that was a lifesaver to have that. So yeah, right. Uh -huh. When, um, you know, one thing I, I, I haven't, I haven't talked about this, but I'm wondering if anybody had to deal with the sanitization of instruments if anybody was sharing instruments and if you want to offer anything that you did for that luckily i didn't have to deal with that but didn't know if anybody else did we have to do that quite a bit um the district supplied us with essentially clorox wipes but not really and they make us kind of nervous and they are stripping the back of the neck a little bit, but we wipe down the fingerboard, the back of the neck, the fine tuners and end pin on cello base. So we stay away from the varnished part, but every time a kid uses the instrument, we wipe it down. And then obviously we have to spray our chairs and stands and wipe all of that as well. So um, there is a lot of cleaning. I gave all of the cellos and basses their own rock stop. So they're at least in their own rosin. So that's one less thing to share. And then, you know, violins and violas lose rosin all the time. So I have rosin hot glued onto walls in my room so they can just walk up and touch the bow hair to the rosin. And that way they're not touching anything. So we've you know tried to come up with as many things we can do to not share things but we do have to run a clorox wipe over our instruments which i'm not a huge fan of but that's what the district asked us to do so that's what we're doing it's a great idea with the the uh rosin i'm gonna steal that one <laughs> mandy anything for you we haven't been in person to share yet that's so true. we, that's we true. haven't i'm about <laughs> to have to figure that out though so i appreciate hearing the advice so far <laughs> Um, I'm hoping it, that yeah. I can work it out so that most students aren't sharing instruments and then I can have certain ones assigned because again, we yeah. will be hybrid. I, about half of my students will be in person and half will be virtual. So it's gonna be interesting yeah. for sure. 
Jenny, did you guys share any instruments? We did not. Um, and our district said absolutely no sharing. So that was exciting. But um, our numbers are down. About a third of our students are in that global academy. And so we have um, less students overall to deal with. So yeah. Yeah. Um, that presents a whole other realm of problems. I was going to say that's a blessing <laughs> and a curse. <laughs> yes, it is. Well, we're going to move to the assessment portion because I think that's one thing that, you know, a lot of our, whether it be performance assessment or whether it be how are we going to show grades when we've got kids at home and they've never been in front of us and is that grade really accurate depiction of what's going on. Um, we had a thing at our school for a while um, about kids even turning their cameras on. And there was this big debate about, you know, can you have a kid turn their camera on or not? And we as a performing arts faculty said, well, it's a visual and audio medium. And unlike maybe an academic class where they can listen to a math lesson um, and maybe see something that's on screen shared, we need to see what they're doing. And so um, that became a thing of how we're going to assess students just by number one, having their camera turned on. But um, I'm interested in, in how you guys are assessing um, your students. Um, if you are in a, an all virtual or even in a hybrid modality to make sure that the in the room kids, we call them rumors and zoomers, but the rumors and the zoomers are in the same um, consideration as far as what is considered an A, a B or a C in terms of performance. So um, Jenny, I'm going to start with you. Uh, do you have any strategies on that or what you've done as far as assessment? Well, I have just um, I've done a little checks. I had to give up my practice journals. That was almost killed me after 36 years. Um, we get in these little ruts, but um, I, I gave those up because I just felt like it, it was onerous on the children. Um, and I could never count that what we started on Monday, we were going to be doing on Friday. So, um, but I did have, uh, I do have like the seesaw lessons and they do go on and they they listen to an uh, instructional videos, and at the end, they do have to respond. So I, my biggest thing that I would say is um, I've, I have not ever expected 100% of the kids to do them. And I think the, the, the pitfall we fall into is that we believe all these kids are going to do these things. And I just don't think it's going to happen. Um, so I have taken the amount of percentage of their grade down for those assignments um, across the board. Um, but the kids get excited that I write back to them and I give them little hints and I tell them how good they're doing and that their parents see those comments and they start talking about it. And it makes the kids that haven't done their assignments more interested in doing those assignments. Plus I'm trying to give them time before school at lunch and after school at the various schools to come in and do them in my classroom so that they don't have to do them at home because some of their internet connections are horrid. And so creating a video is just almost impossible for them. So giving them that option has been really great. And I have gotten a few where they've driven up to the school, pulled out their instrument and done the video in the parking lot because that was where they had the best video connection. So that's been kind of fun. Um, but I, you know, I think our biggest thing as teachers is to not get discouraged when they're not all doing it because it doesn't necessarily mean they don't want to. It just means they may not be able to. Yeah, I take that from a veteran teacher. That's, that's a hard one. Even if you're a young teacher or a new teacher, um, this, is, this year is not a reflection of your ability as a teacher. So please hear us say that loud and clear. And, you know, for, for Jenny to say that with the, the background that she's got um, is, is so true. We just have to take that big, deep breath. And um, those of us that have had that bag of tricks that have worked for years, throw the baby out with the bathwater. On Not one. one of them's working. No. <laughs> I'm making new ones every day. <laughs> That's right. There is no blueprint for this teaching uh, lesson. It's just not going to happen. Mandy, what are some of the things you're doing for assessment? So in just to give you a background on our virtual setting, and we meet three days a week live for 45 minutes, each class fifth, six, seven, and eight separate. And then they have two asynchronous days where we are around for office hours. And those are the days that we will give them assignments so that, you know, they, they have the time to complete them. 
Um, when we go back to the to school, we're calling it hybrid um, because I will have virtual and in-person students. Those virtual kids are going to have to, I, I work this out with the principal, if they are music students, they are expected to attend the lesson, the live lesson every day. But I will be giving them time during class to complete those assignments along with their classmates. So essentially the goal is whether you're in the room or not, you're getting the same lesson, you're getting the same assignments, you're getting the same time to complete. I will have hours set aside, you know, during certain classes um, while they work independently to work one on one with students, whether they're virtual or not. Um, as far as actually assessing them goes, um, we are using the music first, um, which is much like smart music. I'm having them about once a week do a playing test on that. Um, and then I also have Schoology based um, assignments where sometimes it's answering questions like a listening assignment or reflecting on something they performed. Um, recently, I figured out how to do auto graded matching like labeling pictures so I can put a rhythmic figure and they can draw, draw, drag and drop the one and two end and the rest and things in there. That has been life changing. Anything auto graded right now is just what I need <laughs> to survive. Um, and then videos, I, I actually started on Flipgrid, um, but Schoology has a built-in video that is, has been a little bit easier because you don't have to go outside. They're used to being mm -hmm. in that software. Uh, as far as class goes, like informal assessments, I'm lucky if I get one to two students with cameras on. We, uh, as a district, we cannot force them to turn them on. And I understand they, they have a lot of stuff going on at home. Um, you know, even when they unmute, you can hear the like chaos of their siblings and everything in the background. So I try to teach as if all the students are listening. <laughs> and then I try to get them involved by doing informal assessments like polls, one to five. How are you feeling about this topic? And, you know, I can track assessment. I'm, I'm sorry, um, I can track participation. Mm -hmm. um, I can't do anything about it. I can't grade them on it. But like when progress reports come out, I can say, so-and-so has this kind of low grade and it seems like they haven't really been participating in our, you know, whatever we're doing. And Nearpod has been a really great informal assessment um, tool as well, because again, you can see them writing in real time, drawing, writing in countings, drawing in bow directions, matching things. Um, that has been the most awesome thing for live lesson participation um, to get them involved without them having to unmute, without them having to um, feel kind of on the spot. But I am asking them to do uh, at least one or two video assignments so I can assess posture and things like that. Fantastic. Thanks for that information. That's fantastic. All right, Bethany, how about assessment? We um, also use musictheory.net. You can create exercises and there's like a specific link to that exercise. So we do something called Mad Music Minute. I created exercises where there's a timer set for one minute and they have different levels like D string only, D string and A string, D through G. And so right now they're on level four, which is all four of their strings and they just compete to see who can get the most correct notes in one minute. And to them it's a game they sit and they play it at home and get better and I have kids that can get like 80 or 90 notes in one minute which is wow. wild because I'm not even that fast um <laughs> we are a one test district so every kid has an iPad which actually makes things infinitely easier I'm able to push apps under their iPad so their only activity fee this year was to cover their t-shirt and to cover we purchased four score uh staff wars rhythm cat and then te tuner for their iPads so they have access to this. So sometimes their homework is play the first five levels of Rhythm Cat and get at least two stars. And I know that they're understanding rhythms if they're able to get past the levels in that game. And to them, they're playing video games for homework. So yay. Oh, wow. But we also are still doing the video assessments with Canvas, like I talked about earlier. And that's been our main thing. We do weekly playing assignments there. And my district also purchased Smart Music. So we use that as well. I use Smart Music more for the method book because a lot of the music, I'm, I keep picking music that's not in Smart Music, which is frustrating. And I should just look in Smart Music first. But so we use it, we use the Sound Innovations method book and all mm -hmm. of them are up in Smart Music. And then they do separate video assignments for their concert music. That's fantastic. Well, and I'll, I'll throw this out there. Um, I know many of you probably know the name Scott Rush and um, Scott is um, 
uh, a dear friend of mine, but he had co-partnered with um, the author for the um, uh, Habits for a Successful uh, String uh, Performer, String Musician. And the, the orange book, as I call it, is online. Um, I've been pushing him for my, my younger students uh, for the middle level musician book to be put on smart music. And he called me today and said, by next week, that will be on smart music. So just something to know if you're, if you're using that series of book, uh, they're going to have that, that middle level musician on there as well for some of your, your younger students. If you're uh, a high school director as well, or if you're using that for maybe an eighth grade um, student. So that's something to note. Um, one of the things that we hear a lot about right now is tracking student success. I think principals and superintendents are really aware more probably than ever uh, what the pandemic may do to the graduation rate, uh, what it's going to do to students remaining in school. Um, and I've tied some of my curriculum to the national standards. Have you guys experienced any of that where you, you are like on purpose tying things to the national standards to help uh, motivate not only the, the students, but also show principals that you're not dropping your expectations as much as you are just the, the delivery. Any, any thoughts on that from anybody? I can hop in here. Um, we are actually, as a district, still required to go to contest this year. So I am prepping my kids right now for UIL. It's frustrating because I keep losing them to quarantine. Last week I had nine kids in my varsity and I'm supposed to have 29 in person. So we're only taking our in-person students, but my whole district is still going to UIL. We are still competing. And I mean, to me, that's kind of like the standard in Texas is UIL. So yeah. We're still doing it. We haven't had a real concert though. So it's a little scary that their first and only performance is going to be UIL on my cafeteria stage, but it's what we're doing and it's going to be great. We programmed down a little bit just to take the stress off of everybody, but we've still got super fun music. They're into it and they're excited to get some kind of a concert. So that'll be good. Fantastic. They lucky you, lucky you. And GMEA, they've pulled all that for our district. So we're we're doing some in-house stuff this year just to make sure that these kids still have that carrot out there and something that we can do to, to make sure that they get a performance experience. Uh, Mandy, Jenny, uh, you want to talk about the standards or how you guys are measuring things within your program for your, your administration? I think, um, luckily, I have been able to teach to the standards. I don't feel like they're getting necessarily a worse education if you I, however you want to put that um mm -hmm. i you know i am i'm teaching them everything and almost more deliberately i think because i have to think so hard about it i've been planning more intensely than i ever have in my life i mean they're creating they're performing they're evaluating their response they're doing all of those things in a very methodical planned out uh, manner and, you know, in terms of the kids, you know, they're, they're reflecting based on rubrics and, and those rubrics fall in line with the standards. And I think it's, it's a good way for them to look at things. I think they're going to appreciate it much more when we come back in person and we can really like have fun making beautiful music together. Right. But now they've really dug into the skill sets um, and because that's what we've been focusing mainly on instead of that kind of ensemble work. So I'm really happy that I was able to, you know, keep keep up with all of that. Um, and I just hope I can continue. <laughs> right, right. That's great. Jenny, how about in Arizona? Well, I, uh, <laughs> I guess we're rebels out here, you know. Um, I think uh, I think the principals are much more concerned with how the classroom teachers are doing at the elementary school and much less concerned about us. Um, but I don't think that, you know, I always have three things that I'm going for. One is I want them to sound good. I want them to make a beautiful sound on their instrument. I want them to look like a string player. Uh, so we want to have great posture, instrument position, great bow hand, great left hand. And well, I want them to read music. And so those are always my three goals. And um, y'all are too young, but I've lived through multiple different versions of the standards. And I've always found that those three things are the three things that never change. 
And when I asked my junior high teachers, what do you want me to have kids ready for when they get to you? Those are the three things that they say also. So I feel like we're all on the same page as far as what we believe kids need to know. And so we're working towards those goals. And you know, if you're teaching those three things, they make a beautiful sound, they look good, and they can read music, you can fit those into the standards without uh, really much difficulty. So if you have a principal that really goes for that, then you know, you can make it sound good. But really, that's what we do. I, you know, I think it's interesting because Mandy said something that it, 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 she's more even diligent about it, but I think it's a great reflection for us to be able to um, kind of evaluate what we've been doing um, as teachers and, and really put this year and last spring to the test to say, I've been doing this stuff. I'm, ha I'm having to do it in a different way. Um, as my grandfather used to say, just a different way to skin that cat, but um, still you're, you're doing that in a way that is um, satisfying to the kids and you're teaching the things that are core to their success, you know, and, I, and I, that if I could offer any young teacher, when I was at the university, I used to um, um, evaluate student teachers and, and I, I just found that young teachers and student teachers sometimes try to do way more than they need to, um, hoping that that'll, the more they give their kids, the more successful their kids will be. And sometimes we just back off to just like Jenny said, maybe two or three core items um, you'll be amazed at the other things that takes care of if you're teaching just the core items that that are are intrinsic to their success. And I think that's that's such great advice, Jenny. Uh, we always hear less is more, and this is definitely where less is more. It, it just has to be that way. Um, I think one of the things as we 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 wrap up here in the next 10, 15 minutes um, that's on my mind. Um, and, and we're going to, we're going to um, actually um, commit a program to this in the spring is what now? Because several of us have already said we've dropped the level of our program because the number of kids that are actually face to face and how you're going to manipulate, you can't play grade two and three literature sometimes when you've got kids spread out all over the place. Um, the bigger piece is how are we going to, well, how did you keep the kids from last spring to this fall? Um, have you seen any drop off in your program? And how are we gonna recruit that next group of kids that will become your fifth graders or sixth graders, keeping kids in the program seventh and eighth graders and making sure that those eighth graders you've worked so hard for wind up going on into the high school program. More than ever, I think recruitment and retention may be one of the, the byproducts of what happens, not just to music education, but to education period um, after we're done with all this stuff. So does anybody have any thoughts or, or suggestions or reflections or maybe even things that you're starting to see, trends that you might see developing? So we have a lot going on. At the beginning of the year, I feel like some of the students that I lost, I lost because they, um, the parents were overwhelmed and so this was one more thing that they, their child didn't have to do. And so they pulled their child out. I'm starting to see and hear from parents now that they would like their child to maybe come back and maybe join strings now, or that um, could they come back in sixth grade? Could they come back in as a sixth grader? So we, we have really, in our school district, we have one on-ramp and that is fifth grade. And about 92% of our students are either in band or orchestra in the fifth grade. And we've never had to have another on-ramp uh, to get them into our instrumental music program. So next year we are working to have a beginning fifth grade group so that those kids that missed out this year can enter the program. Um, we've already started a beginning seventh grade class and that's going out for uh, next year. So we're trying to develop more opportunities for students to join the program. Um, and uh, I did want to say one thing about, you, you talked about lowering the quality of music or lowering the grade level of music. Um, what we're finding is because we have kids out on quarantine and we have kids that are coming in from global and going back to global, um, that our instrumentation is just a mess. And on any given day, I might not have any low strings or I might have no violins today. So I never know what it's gonna be. So we've 
we've really, um, as, a, as a group, we've decided really that we're going to play uh, more unison music or more music that has kind of a flexible arrangement to it where, um, you know, okay, today you can play the B part and you can play the A part. So that's one of the things that we've done to um, that sound differentiation um, book that Bob Phillips just came out with um, has been really uh, helpful in, in helping to uh, get that, uh, to bridge that gap with the the terrible instrumentation. The other thing that I find interesting, and I'd, I'm interested to find out if it came out in your districts too, but parents did not want kids to play large instruments. So our numbers of cellos and basses is way down. And I have no idea why. I don't know whether it was a financial thing, but renting those are so much more expensive and most of our children do rent. But we do have those available. But we have a lot that are not being used right now because parents just didn't want a big instrument in their home. And again, I wonder if that's just our community or whether it was um, it, it made things more difficult <laughs> on the parent. So that's very, very interesting. You know, one other thing I would recommend, um, and I've got the same issue where uh, one of my orchestras, I'm supposed to have 26 kids in it. And we've had everything from 26 to about two weeks ago when one of my students um, <laughs> came back from the holidays, took a quarantine test and didn't wait for the results and came back and went to four different classes. And on the third day after being back, the health department called and said, she's positive. So she sent home, <laughs> wait for it, 19 orchestra kids uh, from that one class. So we went from 26 to about six in just a blink of an eye and several kids that she had been around. But back to this, my instrumentation was so bad for 14 days. I have a big piano background and I've been playing a lot of piano with the kids just so those parts are filled in. They can hear their melody. They can hear that was the viola part that if they were here, we would know what that is. You know, we don't have a bass today or that bass player sitting at home quarantined. So uh, if, if any of you have piano backgrounds, I would highly recommend that because if nothing else, that's ear training and the kids feel more confident, you know, when the, when the ensemble shrinks to nothing. So something to, to look at. Man, uh, Mandy, how about you? Uh, anything that you've experienced or seen in terms of the, the retention and recruitment? Yeah, in our situation, in our district, the status quo is usually if students get into a magnet school where we're just a regular public school, regular community school, if they get into the magnet, that's where they'll go, right? You want to be in the best schools. Parent, I totally understand parents want the, the kids to go because those magnet schools will feed into the magnet high schools and so forth. So I usually have to very much top heavy load my fifth and sixth grade because after sixth grade, that's when they start going to those schools. Um, so that's that's how it is in the before times, <laughs> as we call it. Um, and then so now I it was even more magnified. Uh, I was lucky that I didn't lose a ton of students in terms of they just didn't want to play anymore. But there were the kids that went to magnet schools and then there were the kids that their parents didn't want them to be in virtual learning. So they're either homeschooled now or they're in another district. Um, so I lost a good chunk of kids just completely gone from the school. So I think the, the biggest thing for me is going to be recruiting going forward. Again, I, I wasn't able to do that, that really big fifth and sixth grade recruitment. Um, I haven't been able to, you know, walk the hallways and go in the cafeteria and like make, you know, get friends of friends to join that sort of thing. I plan on doing that as soon as they come back. Um, but that's, that's going to be a big one for me. So I'm going to really, really have to work as soon as I can, as, as soon as we get back in person. Um, and, and then of course, going forward for next year, I, I was in a fourth grade classroom today in a virtual classroom visiting talking about the orchestra and talking about related arts at our school. So it's, it's going to be a lot of heavy lifting, I think, but I also, like I said, with the, the changes that we did with the kind of exploratory model for half the fifth grade year, I think that's going to be on our side to get more students. Um, so hopefully that going forward, we can just continue that ball rolling and getting that big, big starting for fifth and sixth grade. Great, great advice. Bethany, 
So I'm finding through all of this that the social connection with the kids is kind of the number one thing you've got on your side to keep them, especially this year. You know, most of my kids, orchestra is a sense of comfort for them. It's their happy place. It's the place where they come hang in the mornings. And so we have to social distance hang in the mornings now, but I try to keep that social connection as much as possible. I got really lucky in that we do our recruiting in January. So last year we had recruited our students in January and every one of my incoming kids, except for like two or three, had already been placed on an instrument by the end of February. So um, we got super lucky that that happened because I didn't have to worry about it at all. This year I'm having to. So instead of doing our 20 minute recruiting show that we usually do, we had to make a three minute video and that's a huge difference. But I got my kids to help me. And so they get to talk about how much they love orchestra and just quick little snippets. And we're sending that out to all of the fifth graders and I'm hoping that that goes well. Um, but we also have been very active on our social media accounts, just any way we can to, you know, you know, include the community. Usually we do community performances and stuff that we're not doing this year. So we're just trying to reach out virtually instead. But I do think those social connections have been the number one thing for retention as well. I was talking to um, all of my sixth graders about next year. And I was like, look, guys, I know this is the only orchestra, you know, but I promise orchestra is normally like 10 times better. And I started listing like, we go to medieval times, we play paintball, we get these cool concerts. And it was really sweet. A couple of them raised their hand and they were like, what are you talking about? Orchestra is already my favorite class. Like, of course we're doing orchestra. And I just like, that made my heart so happy because I felt this whole year that I'm just like, not awesome as a teacher because I can't do the things I normally do, but they're still so happy just because they have a place where they can be happy and be with their friends and make music and feel loved and feel cared for. So that's, to me, that's been the number one thing that's kept everybody going and kept everybody together. Well, and that that comes to, you know, kind of a closing point that I just want to kind of, you know, for everybody in the room to leave suggestions and advice for a young teacher um, for the social emotional learning thing. Um, I had a student just recently tell me, in fact, it was last week, say that the same thing. I just said, how are your other classes? And they're like, well, they're small. And, you know, we can't do anything like we, we want to do, but, you know, at least when we come to orchestra, we, we have that release and we can at least express where everything else, we're either reading a computer screen or we're being told what to do. Even for my kids that are at home, they get to go around and we've been doing some composition things um, and they get to play their composition and there's that, that, that outlet and that creativity that's like that's nothing like they get in any other class and I think you know we're because we're such analytical people uh, on one side of the brain for musicians um, that we want to make sure that everybody's enjoying it as much as we love it and I think when we feel that way there's a little bit of insecurity about that but just like Bethany said I think the kids are really leaning on us right now the arts is kind of where they really feel at home where the rest of this thing is gone sideways and haywire. When they pick up that instrument, they're back home. So I think that's that's something that that we can feel good about that we just continue to do and and make them feel great about, you know, being a human being and not losing that spirit, you know, what they're what they're what they're there to do. So I'm gonna start with Mandy, just some just a closing comment maybe from each of you. Um, a motivational tool that you could offer a teacher that wonders if they're the only ones experiencing this and they're the, how are we, how am I going to get to, I'm sure they hear me say 32 years and Jenny 36 or 37 years ago, like I'll never make it. <laughs> uh, I think I would in this situation, but Mandy, what's something you might be able to offer that young teacher? So it's been a very, very emotional year. I mean, all of the things you're used to at, you know, feeding off the students' energy, reading the room, it's, especially in the virtual setting, it's just gone. You know, we don't have our cameras on. You feel, somebody said, it feels like you're recording a podcast. You're just talking to a screen, right? And, you know, like I said, I am, my goal is to teach like everybody is listening, whether they're not or not, I, I don't know, but I'm going to teach like they're listening. So that kid who is engaged is going to get everything they can out of it. But something that has really, really been huge for me to kind of help me get past the, 
insecurity of like, I don't know if I'm doing the right thing. I don't know if they're having fun. I don't know if they're learning anything, you know, besides the assessments. Um, but I don't know if they're loving it, you know, that I don't know if they're really enjoying music. At the end of each quarter so far, we've done a check-in survey and it is the best thing that I have ever done. I usually do one at the end of the year in, in the normal times, um, but we've done a, a short check-in survey where we asked the kids, how did you feel about this quarter? How did you feel about this nine weeks and your learning and strings? And it's all open-ended, you know, um, do you, how comfortable do you feel participating in class, blah, 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 things like that to kind of give you a gauge on like what they're feeling. And then what do you, what do you like about the virtual setting? What, what are some things that you would change? What are some things that you would like to do when we get back in person, got to give them that care, you know, cause a lot of them are just, they want to go back so badly. What is something that you really want to do when we get back and that we can do as a, you know, ensemble together. And then an open-ended question of, is there anything else you want to tell Miss Fun? And the responses that I got were just so like, it was just amazing. It, I, I finally felt one-on-one -on -one connections with kids that I have not seen the whole year because they're just, they don't turn their camera on, they barely use the chat, but they're there. They're there and they're excited and they they said they really liked certain things and I, I'm including them in the class more and more and it's just been a really, really positive thing. So check in with your students, you know, whether it's a, a, a online survey or anonymous thing, whatever you want to do, but you'll, you'll be surprised, I think, at how much impact you're actually making. Good for you, Mandy. That's fantastic to hear. Thank you. Jenny? Well, I would, I would say to stop being hard on yourself. Oh my gosh, we are such perfectionists and we just want to do um, the best we can. And honestly, this is not normal. <laughs> this is not <laughs> what it's supposed to be. And so we have to adjust our goals and we have to say, this is this is okay. It's okay that I'm playing a unis. I'm playing Twinkle Twinkle in, you know, it going into February. I'm just now teaching the D scale. I've never ever taught the D scale in February, um, so it, I have to be okay with where my students are. Um, I, I think that wherever we're at, whatever we're doing, we just need to love kids and. Um, the other day I said, but I love you. So I'm going to let, you know, I was telling they were doing something wrong. And I said, but I still love you. And one of my boys, a big boy, he says, where else in this school can somebody tell me that they love me except right here? And, you know, that made my day and he didn't have any idea how much it made my day, but it really did. And I started, um, I put it on my door this year and um, it was an old music camp saying, we used to say it at the opening ceremony of music camp, which was welcome to the best part of your day. When you have opening ceremony at eight o'clock in the morning at music camp and they've been up until two in the morning, it's a rough time, but we always used to say, welcome to the best part of your day. And I put it on my door this year and I have kids that come in and they'll go, I'm here for the best part of my day. <laughs> and they're so excited to be there. So you don't even know what those little things are that you are doing that are making a difference. And um, I, I just say, make it fun. You know, this, this week I put out a, an email and I said, it just kind of came to me and I said, you know how in the movies there's Easter eggs and in your video games, there's Easter eggs. I said, I'm going to put an Easter egg in your email. And I said, you just have to look for it. And I, all they had to do was write their name and a, draw a quarter note on a piece of paper and they're going to get a piece of candy from me. And, you know, I had more kids read that email than I have had probably all year, but I just wanted to start kind of up in the game and making it fun. And I have one thing that I have done that has really made a big difference. And I give out an award during every class and y'all think I'm crazy, but it's, it's invisible. So I say, and today the invisible orchestra award goes to David Sorens and I, I hand it to you. And of course, the first time the kids kind of go, and they drop, I say, oh, you dropped my award. And I just keep it up and I keep it going and, and they laugh so hard. And then I've 
augmented it by sending their classroom teacher and their parents an email asking them to make sure they show the the trophy and for what they got it well the kids have come back and said my mom's so proud of me she had me put my trophy up on the shelf <laughs> so it sounds really stupid but it has been so it's added a little bit of levity and a lot of fun to my room and one of the girls i gave it to a boy for having a good thumb and one of my girls said i had a good thumb and i said well, maybe tomorrow I'll see your thumb, but I saw his today. And she was like, I want that trophy. <laughs> it's not real. Anyway, That's so awesome. just have fun and find ways to, to make the class your own and, and give the kids a little levity in their life. Uh, and that's nothing more than a kid just wanting acceptance, you know, and that's, that's, that's exactly what that is. That's incredible. Thank you, Jenny. Bethany, any advice for our young crowd out there? I mean, just try to find ways to make those social connections. The first three weeks we were fully remote. And so I had this whole group of sixth graders that I've really never met before, didn't know. But I have now met virtually every single pet, every dog, every cat, every lizard. We did virtual events. We did this fun one where I gave them a list of things from their kitchen, like a, a can of food, two forks a kitchen towel and they had to build their best statue and then show it off to me. Um, you know, we just did silly things like that, but I've also tried to learn a couple things about each kid so I can talk to them about it. Like this kid does dance. This kid has seven dogs. I, I have a student that has seven dogs, which is wild. I have a student that has a 500 pound pig and just little things that you can kind of connect with them on. But then I make sure they know about me too. Like they, they know when I go camping and they ask me questions and they ask to see pictures. And so, just seeing more than just the teacher and student seeing each other as humans and you know understanding each other as humans because right now that humanity and that human connection is really what's keeping us all going and keeping us all here and it's kind of the reason why we love music is that we're sharing that connection together that's so great and and i hope anybody that's out there hears this stuff and knows that probably at the beginning of this year all of us uh, that are veteran teachers panicked. I know I did. Um, I wasn't sure I was good enough for this. I was learning more technology than I had learned in 25 years. Um, like I said, I was at the university level for 10 years, and you stop learning when you teach college. <laughs> you just think you know it all. And then when you come back and you're thrown into this, this is a complete different situation, and um, none of us are accustomed to this. So this too shall pass, and then you get to go back to everything you were taught in college to be able to do um, in the education world. So um, I just want to say a huge thank you to our panel tonight, Mandy, Jenny, and Bethany. Uh, you've been fantastic, and um, you came so highly recommended to Music for All, and uh, we were so fortunate to, to hear from you tonight. And, and I think it's good that we for me, I'm sitting here going like, you know, I'm dealing with this same stuff. We're all in this together, guys. And I think that uh, Jenny, Man Jenny, Mandy, and um, Bethany made that very, very clear tonight. So on behalf of Music for All, uh, the Yamaha Corporation of America, I'm David Starnes. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's Mind the Gap. And thank you to our panel. And we hope you'll join us again for another episode very, very soon. Good night, everyone. <laughs>